Shri Tripura Rahasyam Mahatmya Khandam Aum Shri Ganesha Sharada Guru Bhyo Namaha Namaste. So before we get into the story part of Tripura Rahasya, the Mahatmya Khanda, we should understand who these characters represent. Huh? Because all these characters are not only literal people, huh? personalities, existences, but they also have a, uh, how can I say, symbolic value, uh, a metaphorical interpretation. Vedic literature is like that. It's literal on one level, but then there are deeper and deeper levels of interpretation. Sanskrit language is built like that. It's a consciously created language for spiritual communication. So, because these concepts are very difficult for Western audiences, I wanted to find some equivalent concepts in the Western literature, and I did. Last time, we introduced very briefly Jung's concept of the anima. Well, what is the anima? Well, each of us has a deep gestalt, huh? a collection of impressions, attitudes, drives, and so on, connected with masculinity and femininity. And these are called the animus and the anima, respectively. So the animus is our idea of what a man should be like, or what man in general is like. And anima is the same thing for a woman. So a good indicator of someone's personal growth, a psychological and emotional development, is their concept of animus and anima. And they don't necessarily evolve at the same rate. So it's possible for someone to be unbalanced and have, for example, a more developed animus than anima. And in Western civilization, so-called civilization, <laughs> Gandhi once said, uh, was asked, what do you think of Western civilization? He said, I think it would be a good idea. <laughs> so anyway, in Western society, <laughs> Pashu society, the concept of the animus is developed far beyond the concept of anima. Another way to say this is that Western culture is biased towards masculinity. And certainly most people, and especially most women, would agree with you <laughs> that the power and the uh, cultural concept is definitely biased toward the male point of view. It wasn't always like this. In the early Vedic days, back in Satya Yuga, the society was matrilineal. And men came and went. <laughs> there was no marriage as such. But if uh, it was called Gandharva marriage, if, if two people fell in love, then they would have an affair. And if a child resulted, great, you know. But the man was not attached. It's not like he made a promise for life, you know, or something like this. Uh, that's a recent invention of Judaism and Christianity. The uh, Abrahamic religions. Huh? I think it's really funny because knowing that in the old days, there was only one culture on the earth and it was Vedic culture. So many, many words have a history going all the way back to the Vedic culture, Sanskrit language, and meanings. Uh, etymologically, uh, probably something like 80% of our vocabulary in English is based on Sanskrit roots. 
So who is this Abraham? Huh? <laughs> Abraham means non-spiritual. Or another interpretation is Abrahmana. He's not a Brahmin. Huh? <laughs> He doesn't, he doesn't have really spiritual knowledge. And we see the Abrahamic religions have a dualistic concept of God. But God is not dualistic. <laughs> God is non-dual. So they miss. And they are not a sufficient platform for full self-realization. So therefore their concept of animus and anima is heavily biased towards the male. It's a male-dominant religion. God is seen as masculine, isn't it? And uh, there is the Divine Mother, but in West, that's a, a less important concept. In Now, in Eastern Orthodox Christianity, the Divine Mother is a very important concept, and that's why I always said the Eastern Orthodox Church got it uh, much clearer, much higher uh, concept of religion than the Western Christianity. But anyway, let's go into Jung's. Uh, C.G. Jung, Carl Jung, was a disciple of Freud. And Freud was able to diagnose the problem. He was a good doctor. He was a good physician, a good psychiatrist. Uh, he was able to diagnose the psychological problem. And the, the root psychological problem is we have a distorted idea of man and woman, and what their roles should be, what their nature is, what we can expect from them, uh, or how we should be as a man or a woman. In other words, it's an identity problem. And of course, then, whatever our concept of man and woman is, we project that on others, and we expect them to follow these same uh, values. And of course, most of the time they don't, <laughs> which creates uh, cognitive dissonance. And this cognitive dissonance is known as neurosis. We become patterned by our early experience, and then we can't seem to break out of that pattern, even though we know it's not fulfilling. So Jung, like most of Freud's prominent uh, students, took it a step farther. He said, okay, there are these concepts of animus and anima, and they can develop from lower to higher states. And this is a very important part of the process of self-development, human development, or human potential. All these terms were coined by Jung. So Jung broadly divided the stages of animus and anima into four categories. Uh, and he got these categories from the Eastern knowledge. He was very much impressed by Morrissey's book on Tantra. And he wove that into all his work. So, of course, we're now dealing with the Tantras directly. <laughs> so, these concepts become very salient, uh, very important. So, what are Jung's four stages? Well, we're going to look at the anima development because it's directly applied to the current topic of Tripura Sundari. The earliest stage he called Eve, as in the biblical character, Eve. Eve is seen as earthy, purely biological woman, huh? a woman as mother and really just a sex object to be fertilized by men. Used, you know, and left behind. So this is a very low animalistic concept of woman. But isn't it very common? Isn't it really pervasive in our society? And especially uh, now entertainers. Uh, since Madonna, especially, K 
cast themselves in this role of the whore. So this idea is, uh, penetrates the whole society. And of course, uh, commercial advertisements and stuff like that use sex to sell their products. Movies, pop songs, pop culture in general is based on this idea of woman as sex object. And women are especially, uh, they're expected to decorate their bodies to make them more sexually attractive and so on. But this is a very low concept, huh? and really an animalistic concept. The next stage is called Helen, as in Helen of Troy. And this is the woman as romantic heroine. Okay, Helen of Troy, of course, was a great a figure in the French Revolution. And uh, earlier, uh, she was a part of history, uh, the Siege of Troy and all that. You should just look these things up if you want more clarity. I'm not going to go because I'm not going to go into it so deeply because I'm almost out of time already. So this idea of the romantic heroine is dominated by aesthetic eros. Huh? Now the woman is not viewed so much as just a piece of meat, but as, as energy, a certain kind of energy, heroic, romantic, huh? uh, willing to fight or even die for a cause. Huh? And uh, now the thing about it is, this individualizes woman for the first time. And this is very much connected with the idea of uh, woman's emancipation, woman's suffrage. In other words, women having the vote. Uh, women's liberation uh, is based off this idea, the idea of the romantic heroine that the woman is supposed to actually lead the man into a high state of emotional ecstasy. And this is called love, the romantic ideal. And it's very much a driver of romantic and so-called enlightenment society, Western society, since the 1800s. So there is a higher stage, though. And Jung called that Mary as in Mary Magdalene. So this is spiritual motherhood. It's another idea from the Bible. And the interesting thing about this, now, now mother becomes like an object of worship. For, for this first time, a female figure is introduced into the pantheon of worshipable objects. And Eros itself is now raised to a high level of almost like a god himself. So, of course, this is a very, very well-known idea in the Vedas, where Eros is known as Kamadev, the god of love, or the god of actually erotic love. Huh? So this, because we have to recognize, as psychiatry and psychology does, that eros, or the sexual drive, is a very important driver in our psychology. That doesn't mean it should be the dominant force, but it's a very strong biological force. It has to be reckoned with. Otherwise, it can destroy us, it can lead us into addiction, and so on. So, Kamadev, in the Vedic system, is uh, always up to some mischief. Huh? He's going around with his bow and arrows, <laughs> hitting people in the heart and making them fall in lust. <laughs> of course, now they romanticize this and they call it love and so on. But really, it's driven by sex desire. You know, let's be honest about it. Vedas are. This is a very high ideal. Now, woman finally becomes worshipable, huh? at least in the mother 
uh, image. And this mother, this rasa of motherly, motherly love is very important in the Vedas. But there's still a higher stage. And Jung called this Sophia. And Sophia, he identified with sapientia. Sapientia is an old uh, Latin word that means consciousness, sapience. So this is very, very uh, deep huh? that, the, that woman or the highest feminine ideal is identified with consciousness. Well, why? Because consciousness is receptive. Consciousness is not an actor. Consciousness is simply a witness. Uh, consciousness doesn't do anything. It just reflects whatever is put before it. So in this way, this is, this is a very refined, very sublime expression of femininity. And uh, he mentioned that Sophia, Sophia, you can look up this uh, concept too in Christian history, is the feminine equivalent of Christ. Okay, so the Savior, as a woman, is called Sophia. And Sophia is identified as consciousness. Is there a similar character in Vedas? Yes. <laughs> Tripura Sundari. <laughs> Tripura, the goddess Tripura, is explicitly known as consciousness. So as consciousness, she is the highest deity. All the other deities and forms, what to speak of, the world, phenomena, personalities, individuals, and so on, are all derived from her. And we'll see again and again in this book, Tripura Rahasya, that she is addressed as the highest consciousness. And from this consciousness, everything else has manifested. Isn't it? Isn't this our experience? Huh? When we awaken in the morning, the whole world comes into existence. And when we go to sleep at night, it fades away. <laughs> and another world takes its place, the world of dreams in our consciousness. And then in deep sleep, even that fades away and there's nothing, only pure awareness. And when one becomes advanced in yoga, one can remain aware even in deep sleep. And this is called nirvikalpa samadhi. Uh, when the individual becomes completely uh, merged with consciousness without any sense inputs, without any impressions. This is a beautiful state. And this is also known as nirvana. So this is a very high concept. And uh, in the next episode, we're going to see how these four stages of anima correlate with the four views, the Chatur Darshana that we learned from Shankaracharya and which categorize the stages of spiritual development. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Harihi Aung.